muy buena. All right, we begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Uh, last week, Russell asked a question about the, the holy angel, if that was anyone in particular, and I kind of gave the answer um, as I could off the top of my head. I did do a little bit more investigating and uh, no, no specific identity, and it isn't even necessarily that it's... Uh, uh, only one angel, but um, the everything I found was just, again, referencing the fact that uh, angels are God's ministering spirits, and he uh, does use them to, to take care of us. So, all right, we are on page 110. Last week, we did the introduction of the Eighth Commandment, um, and as we're doing so, again, to me, I like to, to see the, the logic. I like to see structure. I like to see how everything kind of works together. And so we know that the Ten Commandments kind of break down into the two tables, the two halves. Um, the Ten Commandments is summarized by Jesus' Jesus's words as, how do you summarize the law to, in Jesus' words? No, no. <laughs> Love love God and love your neighbors yourself. Sorry, it was a pretty open question, but Molly, Molly figured out what I was talking about. Um, so we talk about those as the two tables of the law, the two parts, the part that is directly talking about loving God and the part that's talking about loving your neighbor as yourselves. Although we understand that the second part, the loving your neighbor as yourself, um, also does include loving God. Uh, we don't have the option as Christians to say, oh, I'm going to love God, but not my neighbor. If you don't love your neighbor, you're not loving God. If you don't love God, um, lo loving your neighbor isn't going to really work. You're not going to truly understand because you won't know what is the greatest good for your neighbor. You might love your neighbor in the way that you think is right, but that won't necessarily be in line with what God thinks um, is right and can lead you to uh, all, all, all sorts of problems. So the first three commandments are the first part of the law. And, and so generally, as I think about them, not merely as the words that the commandment, commandments give, but the ideas, what is, what is the topic of that commandment? Um, the first commandment is about God himself and our relationship with him, that he wants to have a relationship with us. And that relationship is one that includes fear, love, and trust. Um, so our complete devotion to him. The, the second commandment is about God's name. Don't take God's name in vain. And uh, he gives us his name for prayer, for praise, to proclaim his name. His name isn't merely um, a, a title um, or what we call him, but it's, it's who he is. It's his whole identity, and we learn about the, the nature of God. The third commandment is about uh, how time uh, is in God's hands, and he gives us time as a gift, and he tells us how to use that time. He talks about the, the importance of rest in the rhythm of life, and in that worship, and how worship is a central part of our time here on earth and um, for all eternity. So these are sort of like, again, topics and ideas. So as we get to the eighth commandment, like I said, we kind of get to this thing that to us, we wouldn't necessarily have thought was a gift from God or one of his many blessings, the, the gift of our reputation. But you can see that it is a gift from God and its importance is sort of mirrored in the first part of the Ten Commandments, because what commandment does the Eighth Commandment kind of connect back to, um, as you think about the topic of it? What commandment does the Eighth Commandment sort of have a connection or relationship to? Well, the Second Commandment. Yeah. So, 
God's name is, is important. God wants us to know who he is truly, and he wants the way that we use his name and tell about him to others to be truthful and accurate, to be faithful to him, to not give a false witness, to not use his name in vain, um, and so misrepresent him. So God himself cares about his own reputation, and he also cares about our reputation. And we can see how our reputation will eventually tie back to him. Um, and so there is kind of this internal connection between the eighth commandment and the second commandment. Um, if others know you as Christians and they see how you live your life, or even that you do a really good job of living your life as a faithful Christian, um, and they break this commandment. They testify falsely against you. They gossip about you or spread rumors about you. Even if those things are not true, it will affect other people's perception of you, but more than just you, because God put his name on you. You are a Christian. You are his. It's going to affect what they think about other Christians and therefore about God himself. So um, this commandment, again, we, we at first think, oh, this is kind of a minor thing, but it really directs us back to the first part of the Ten Commandments, and it, it truly is an important thing. Um, how we live faithfully, and even if we do that to the best of our ability, um, others can still malign our name and reputation, and in so doing, try to malign God's good name and reputation as well. So again, just to me, making those connections, um, memorizing the Ten Commandments to me is more than just like, oh, can you say all of the words? Uh, it's, it's knowing what's behind them. Um, it's knowing how they work, how they function. A lot of what we look at the Ten Commandments as today, um, the Ten Commandments is law. It, it does convict us. It does accuse us and show us our sin. But as Christians, we also have this relationship to the law that we can see the law as wisdom. And, and wisdom is only wisdom when you know how to use it. You know how it applies to situations. Again, the, the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is just, it's something stuck in your head, but it doesn't really affect uh, your life. It doesn't affect how you live, what decisions you make. But wisdom does that. And it's wisdom that starts to understand what these commandments are about, to understand it's not just God saying, don't do this. You're bad when you do this. But it's looking beyond that and seeing what are the gifts? What are the blessings that God gives us? And how will it hurt us when we live apart from his ways? Um, and so we want to look at those commandments this way. And that's really why it takes us such a long time um, to move through these, because we want to try to apply this. We want to know what does this what does this matter? What does this mean in the world today? And it generally means a lot if we just take the time to, to think about it um, and process it. Dale? Well, what I think about is. It, it seems to be more proactive. It's more a positive approach, and it fits more with the um, the third use of the law. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so when we focus on the gifts mm -hmm. and how do we protect those gifts, mm -hmm. um, then we're thinking, uh, how do we live our life in accordance with the will of God? And mm -hmm. the commandments are an expression of his will. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I sort of, I think Pastor Moore was the first one that sort of taught me to look at the, these as gifts. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in the 1991 edition of the Catechism, mm -hmm. uh, under each commandment in parentheses, it identifies the gift. Mm -hmm. So I was sort of yeah. disappointed to see yeah. it gone from this one. Yeah, I, I, it was removed. I would agree. It's 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 a. It's a good a good insight into the commandments, um, and it does get back to thinking about our our sanctification, our walk as as Christians in the world, 
and seeing that we need to live by the Holy Spirit's power. We need to live by the word of God and the word of God guides us. So we go back to the Ten Commandments. We go back to these words and we see that it is really a light to show us where to go and how to walk. Okay, let's really read the Eighth Commandment again and its meaning. So Eighth Commandment. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. All right, somebody want to read the first three paragraphs of the central thought? God commands us to speak truthfully and charitably about our neighbors so that the others so that others view them in the best possible light. What are some ways by which the person's reputation is damaged in our society? We'll pause there actually. So what are some ways uh, by which a person's reputation is damaged in our society? Social media. Social media. Yes. I live in the villages. I see a lot of people in public that are totally intoxicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So their 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 own actions can um, destroy their their reputation. Um, others see that, and we'll talk. Gosh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We talked about how how malicious uh, and toxic gossip is. There was an old saying that says, if you can't speak well of them, don't say anything. Don't yeah. Speak. Yeah. That's why I don't say a lot. Our <laughs> <laughs> trouble is you know us too well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it is it is that talking behind the back and it takes different forms. So today social media is just one form, but it's accomplishing the same end. Um newspapers, uh, radio, TV, all of the different media that exist out there. Um, but but yeah, there there is there is sometimes a culpability here of well, are are people really giving false witness or are they just amplifying a negative behavior? Remember last time we also talked about how the human heart wants to believe evil about somebody more than it does good. And so how many of you, when you see somebody doing good, do you share and spread that with other people versus you see somebody doing something wrong and now you want to tell others, did you, did you see that? Did you know that this happened? Um, and we act as amplifiers. Now, the person, they, they in a sense did ruin their own reputation by doing a bad thing, but we are the, the amplifier on that, and we will spread that to other people. Okay, now the next paragraph. Uh, Tom. Read. What are some ways? Is uh, read Mark, that, that one. Mark 14, 3 to 9. And as we do so, what are we looking for? See how Jesus defends and praises the woman who anointed him. So Mark 14, 3 through 9. And while he was in, in Bethany at the home of Simon, the leper, and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial and a very costly perfume of pure nard. And she spoke, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor, and they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For the poor you always have with you, and whether you wish you can do them good, and, and whenever you wish you can do them good, but you do not always have me. And she... She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. And truly, I say to you, whenever the gospel is preached in the whole world, that also which 
that also which this woman has done shall be spoken of in memory of her. Yeah. So what did the people that spoke against her, what, what was the thing wrong that they did? Criticizing her. Criticizing her. They, they, were, they were judging her motives. Um, you know, hey, you have a lot of money, apparently, because this was really valuable ointment. Um, and you just you just waste it like that. So, again, they're they making a value call, a judgment call um, about her motives and what was going on here. Um, and then that led to that criticism of her. Um, how does Jesus disagree or give a different view? She's going to become famous for the book, for the act that she's done. She's done. Mm -hmm. So think, think, and speak well here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pam, I have a really hard time with this passage mm -hmm. because I actually, like in my own little life right now, mm -hmm. understand completely why they said what they said to her. Mm -hmm. And had it not been Jesus, and mm -hmm. she had done something mm -hmm. and wasted. Mm -hmm. Would the reaction be the same, or was it because she believed that Jesus was the Messiah and she did something specifically for God? Mm -hmm. It's just it's just hard for me yeah. to reconcile it because even today, yeah, it does look waste and lavish, and yeah. yeah, I mean, just in society, people say that all the time about rich people and the way they spend their money. Yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, we we. We can never see into people's hearts and know their real motives. And frankly, sometimes people don't understand their motives themselves. They they just do things. Um, but Jesus, being God, can can see into the hearts. And so it, it it is difficult to know, like, well, I mean, how how does she know all of this? Why is she doing that? But again, Jesus has been um speaking of his impending death. And, and what is to come. And so she she could have heard that and been like, well, you know, I, I want to do this thing while he's still here with me. And she chose to do that. But um, it is it is a pure and devoted act, a, a worshipful act. Um, what what good does it do this woman? You know, what what is she getting in return for this? Um, so it's not a it's not a selfish act on her part. Uh, we do, you know, again, well, hey, it, again, it could have could have used this money for other things and it could have helped other people. But but here it was specifically uh, directed to Jesus and he interprets the event. And again, it's hard to disagree with Jesus. So he says, hey, she's doing this because I'm I'm going to die. She's doing this to anoint me. I'm not always going to be here uh, with you. Um, you know, as we learn more about this and uh, some of the other gospels, I, I think they also understand more that's going on. So in John's gospel, uh, Judas is is sort of the voice that you hear about, you know, hey, this is wasteful. And the editorial there is, well, Judas didn't actually care about the poor. He He would take some of that money for himself. And Jesus here, he knows that too. He's, he's not trying to take away and like turn this into the Judas show now. He's just honoring this woman in that conversation and trying to put to rest these, these criticisms. Um, I mean, the fact is that Jesus uh, says that she's going to be remembered and she's remembered why? Because Jesus speaks well of her, because Jesus does commend her again. We're, we're sometimes probably going to side with those disciples and be like, but, but, but Jesus's word is, is the final word. It's the one that matters. And um, so he, he takes that and, and speaks well of her. And I think the importance there is that Jesus gets the final word for all of us, right? Um, you know, uh, imagine somebody else coming up and wa walking alongside us in our life and saying, look at, look at, they did that. Why, why did they do that? They could have done this instead, and that would have actually helped people and whatnot. Um, and, and maybe they're right, and maybe our motives are wrong, but the last words that are spoken of us are, are the kind words of Jesus, um, who, 
again, won't, won't even have to try to fix our motives, but we'll say, but I died for him. I died for her, that, that her sins would be forgiven, that his sins are forgiven. And so in this commandment, thinking about the false testimony and false witness that we say, um, none of that holds a candle to what is God's judgment. So we want to be lined up with him. And I think the commandment teaches us to speak more like Jesus would speak and less like we in our own sinful thoughts um, and motives might, might direct ourselves to, to speak instead. Yeah. Do you think it's because <clears throat> people have this tendency to want to make judgments about who's more deserving and who is less deserving? Mm -hmm. And and we really can't see that. Mm -hmm. A rich person may be so spiritually poor as to mm -hmm. be destitute. Yeah. But we can't see that. Yeah. And so Jesus' parable about the sheep and the goats, I, I think this this one gets me all the time of, hey, he divides these two groups of people. One, hey, uh, I was in jail and you visited me. I, I didn't have food and you gave me food. You comforted me. And the sheep, the ones who will inherit eternal life, they're like, no, we didn't. Um, <laughs> what, what are you talking about? Um, and then he says, whenever you did this to the least of these, you did it unto me. And then he gets to the goats, same thing. And they're like, no, Jesus, if we would, if we would have known you would have been in jail, we would have visited you. If we would have known that you needed food, we would have given you food. And so the, the thing in common there in both of them is they, they did or didn't do those things um, out of their own hearts. They weren't trying to do it to to get ahead the those well those who were the sheep they didn't try to do it to get ahead um they just did that anyway and they did it to the least deserving versus the people who are on the goat side they would have done it if they would have thought people more deserving but because they didn't see people as deserving they didn't do those things and jesus says because you didn't do them to the least deserving you didn't do them to me um, and and so our own again our motivations and why we do things and can we see who deserves it and who doesn't um we can't and and really we're not called to in a sense um we're to do it to those that to our own eyes might be the least worthy of it and and jesus says in in so doing you're actually doing it unto me because again, we all are recipients of God's grace. Do we deserve that? No, but that's how God acts. He shares his love, his kindness, even with the worst of the worst. And so talking about the commandments and all of this again as, as wisdom for us and how it's shaping us, it's shaping us to be more like Jesus. And, and to do that. Now, that doesn't seem like wisdom in this world. It seems foolishness. But the foolishness of this world and God's wisdom, they're, they're really, you know, more, more in common than we might think. Um, well, yeah. And, and I think, you know, trying to not reduce things to sound bites mm -hmm. and allowing allowing some nuance to to enter into the conversation mm -hmm. um with the the thing that strikes me about this comment this commandment is uh to speak well of him and explain everything in the kind of kindest way like assume people have good attention mm -hmm. or at least that they 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 aren't trying to be evil mm -hmm. um they think that they are doing the right thing with their situation. Mm -hmm. And if you think that they are doing the wrong thing in the situation, mm -hmm. understanding where they're coming from is how you make a change mm -hmm. as opposed to saying you're doing the wrong thing and you need to stop doing this thing that you think is the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like, but no, I think I'm doing the right thing. That's mm -hmm. what I'm going to do. Um, yeah. You know, so allowing the time and space to have those conversations and to understand the other person's point of view mm -hmm. um, is 
ultimately the way that we work together and make change. And and even if they are bent on destruction and ruin, again, what does that say about them? They're they're sinners uh, held hostage in Satan's domain. How how are we going to rescue them by by sharing God's light, by sharing His love, by sharing His grace? We're not going to rescue them by um, th throwing them away and saying, "Ah, you're condemned." Well, that's that's not going to bring them back. Um, Again, though, you're you're right of we don't reduce things to sound bites. Um, so even though we say all of this, I'm not saying we, we don't ever speak the law to them. Um, we don't ever tell them, hey, th this is wrong and you are wrong if they're doing the wrong things for the wrong reasons. Y you have to do that, too. So that point about this, none of this is, is sound bite theology. Um, you do need wisdom. You do need discernment to know, hey, sometimes it might seem like the gospel contradicts itself, but read through the book of Proverbs sometime and just sit in there. You can find Proverbs that say the opposite thing. And you're like, how can that be true? Well, again, if you've lived this life, you know sometimes um, what, one thing will work in one situation, but it won't work in a different situation. There might be more going on, and it's wisdom that understands the difference between this. Joan, you had a... When I think of things that they don't really say in Scripture, mm -hmm. but if you think this person, this lady, I think her name was Mary, mm -hmm. she had this, this expensive perfume. Mm -hmm. It was like a she never even thought about, I think, what that cost was. Mm -hmm. She loved the Lord. Mm -hmm. She understood what was coming. And out of an enormous act of, <clears throat> of love mm -hmm. and adoration and what this person meant to her, she didn't care about the money. Mm -hmm. She just wanted to give them the skill. Mm -hmm. And that's very special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just I just looked at it. It was like sacrificing. Perhaps she might have needed the money for something else. Mm -hmm. Maybe she had thought of even selling it and giving it to the poor. Yeah, but she felt no. The most appropriate thing I could do mm -hmm. is use it in this way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm, so, I'm sure that <clears throat> because of his response, Christ saw that. Yeah, and and again, what what do I see? The eyes see that was worth. So 300 denarii, a denarii is one day's income. So it was basically a, a almost an entire year's worth of, so we're talking a pretty large sum and oh, what a waste. But again, contrast that with the story of the widow's might, right? Here, here, here's a woman who throws in nothing. I mean, it is, it's not going to do anything, but that was all she had and the, the great gift. We don't know more about this woman's situation. Maybe she was very wealthy. Maybe this was no big deal at all. And the disciples were like, again, criticizing like, hey, she has all of this wealth and she, you know, uses it to do all these stupid things. Um, or she might have been like the widow. And this was, you know, a heirloom in her family. And this was all she had. And she wanted to give it up. We don't know that part. Again, Jesus knows a lot more than we do. So we trust his judgment when he commends this woman and he ends up preserving a story that fulfills the eighth commandment about her, um, speaking well of her. All right, so the central thought in the bold print, as Christians, we seek to improve and protect the reputation of others so that people will think well of them. And the question to think about who in my life or community needs me to speak well of them? I'll let you uh, add your own personal <laughs> contemplation on that. Question 83. Why is a good reputation important? Somebody want to read the answer? A good name or reputation is important so that each of us may enjoy the trust and respect of others. Okay. So you kind of see another connection here. <laughs> Um, a good name and reputation leads to a relationship. Uh, you can't have a relationship with somebody if you don't know them or you think they're wicked or evil. Um, so we are trying to help them to be able to have relationships 
It was sort of the same thing with God. He wants us to have a relationship with him, but people aren't going to want to have a relationship with him if they think only negative things about him. If they knew who he really was, why wouldn't more people want to have a relationship with that kind of God? Um, again, throughout history, you see the types of gods that people devoted themselves to and the things that those gods asked them to do according to their own religious texts or religious leaders, um, including uh, sacrificing their own children, um, temple prostitution, etc., cetera, um, all sorts of things. And people were willing to do that because they were afraid of those gods. Um, they had a lot of terror about them because they were capricious. Um, they could decide on a whim to, to hurt or harm somebody. So you always want to um, try to do your best to appease them. Well, well, God is a very different kind of God. In some ways, it looks like God is a pushover because he does forgive, because he is compassionate. But again, without a God who's like that, we would really have no desire to have a relationship with him. We would just be um, about fulfilling obligations toward him. And God wants us to be oriented not, not about outward obligation, but about that internal love uh, toward him and then toward others. So yeah, reputation and relationship, they, they go together. Proverbs 22, one. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and favor is better than silver or gold. Yeah, and that's a proverb. You think about that. Is it? Is it really? I, I don't know. I'd rather have a lot of gold. Um, <laughs> yeah, but what if you don't need it? If you had favor, mm -hmm. they might just let you in somewhere that you couldn't, you'd have to buy to get in. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. Or give you stuff. Yeah. And and friends, what's the cost of friends? They're priceless, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. So mon money can't buy friends. Money can't buy happiness. We We lift up money so much, but... Proverbs speaks true wisdom. Uh, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Ecclesiastes 7 1. A good, a good name, name is better than precious ointment. Well, that's kind of ironic, isn't it? Especially given Mark 14. Uh, because of the good ointment, that woman uh, receives a good name from Jesus. Uh, 84. How do we fear and love God in keeping the eighth commandment? Somebody want to read the first part? We fear and love God by. By not speaking about others in ways that harm them. Harmful speech includes. Yep, you can read the next one. Hey. By telling lies about our neighbors in everyday life or in court or law. Yeah, so harming our neighbor is uh, can include um, not speaking about others in ways that harm them. No, we're, we're categorizing different kinds of harmful speech. So lies. Um, Matthew 26, 59 through 61. Now the chief priests and of the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they may put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Yeah. So again, uh, the, the prime example of breaking this commandment and, you know, what we think is by far the worst is the false testimony that was involved in trying to condemn Jesus. And it was so crudely and poorly organized that uh, Pontius Pilate, the governor, is like, no, like th this evidence doesn't hold up. This, this evidence doesn't count. Um, but they were just trying to get anything wrong to stick about Jesus. And uh, they brought all of these lies forward, which, again, were, in a sense, half-truths, some of them, um, but they, they misrepresented his word and didn't understand it. Colossians 3, 9. Somebody read that one. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Okay. So this is Paul's word to the Colossians. Uh, lying is a part of the old Adam. It's a part of the sinful flesh, not what God would have us to do now. Okay, uh, two uh, somewhat obscure stories. The first is less obscure, but 1 Kings 21, verse 13. Um, so 1 Kings 21. 
before Psalms in the Old Testament, after Samuel, before Chronicles, 1 Kings 21. And there came in two men, children of Belial, or the devil, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. And then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones yeah. that he died. So um, chapter 21, uh, your heading might be a little dip different, but Naboth's vineyard is this whole chapter, or the first part of it especially. Um, the second part of 21 is the aftermath. So this is the time of King Ahab and uh, Queen Jezebel. Uh, Ahab was the, the Jew, the Israelite. Jezebel was a, a foreigner, a Canaanite, and um, bad, bad, bad news. And she influenced Ahab to, to do things far worse than were in Ahab um, on his own. And one of the things that that is uh, told of that kingship and her influence was that Naboth has this has this vineyard, and it was a nice vineyard, produced great crop, great location, and so the king and the queen, they they want that. Well, there there is law and order; they can't just take stuff. So they weren't true like um, tyrants and dictators in that sense. So you kind of had to like ask, you know, we want to buy that. Do you want to sell it? No, no, no. Um, does doesn't want to. Well. Then um, Na Naboth is going to, in a sense, be put into a bad situation here by Jezebel. And so she's orchestrating all of this kind of in the background, which leads up to the part that was read. Um, so just before that, in, in par um, verse 8, uh, she is Jezebel. She wrote letters in Ahab's name, sealed them with his seal, and she sent the letters to the elders and the leaders who lived with Naboth in his city. And she wrote in the letters, proclaim a fast and set Naboth at the head of the people and then set two worthless men opposite him and let them bring a charge against him saying, you have cursed God and the king, then take him out and stone him to death. So in other words, make up this charge, get him out of the picture, kill him, and then they'll swoop in there and they'll get that vineyard that they wanted. So um, it's an extremely audacious act but it is made good on the outside by putting forward these false witnesses so that they, in the background, they're really, Ahab and Jezebel especially, are really controlling all of this, but they nobody knows about that um, other than these insiders that follow these uh, secret letters that have been written to them. So um, it's, it's a pretty brazen example of false testimony and about urging other people to give that false testimony because again on the outside Ahab and Jezebel to everybody else they're not involved so they've preserved their own reputation in a sense by getting these other people to do their dirty business which wasn't that much different than the what the chief priests um, and the leaders of Israel did with Jesus bring forward the false witnesses and let them do the dirty work or even Judas himself. Um, let him do the dirty work and we'll all operate behind the scenes. All right, so Naboth's vineyard, um, kind of a, a crazy time, uh, Ahab and Jezebel. This is when Elijah was the prophet. Uh, he, he was not a fan of Ahab and Jezebel, tried to speak God's word to him, to both of them, and Jezebel wanted Ahab dead. Um, all right, the next one, 2 Kings, somebody have that verse? 2 Kings 5, 19 through 27. He said to him, go in peace. But when Naaman had gone from him a short distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, See, my master has spared his spared this name in the Syrian, in not accepting from his hand what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi followed Naaman. And when Naaman saw someone running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me to say, There have just now come from, to me from the hill country of Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. 
please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothing. And Naaman said, be pleased to accept two talents. And he urged him and tied, tied up two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothing and laid them on two of his servants. And they carried them before Gehazi. And when he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and put them in the house. And he sent them in away, and they departed. He went in and, and stood before his master. Elijah and said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant went nowhere. But he said to him, Did not my heart go when the man turned from his chariot to meet you? Was it a time to accept money and garments, olive orchards and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male servants and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper like snow. Yeah, so maybe, maybe, maybe you remember the Bible story about Naaman healing uh, or about Elisha healing Naaman. Naaman is not an Israelite. He's he's a foreigner, but God uses Elisha. Elisha cures him of the leprosy. He dips his his hand and there's uh himself into the Jordan River. He's cleansed. But Gehazi, who was a servant working with Elisha, again, there's probably a little bit of racism here of, you know, we're better than these people. Uh, I can't believe that you did this for the Syrian, for somebody who's not part of God's people, but then you did it for free out of grace. Um, and that's not right. So Gehazi runs back to Naaman, sees him in the chariot, and is like, uh, you owe us a couple talents of silver, some nice clothes. And Naaman's like, sure, you know, I'll do anything for a servant of God. Gives him that. And then Gehazi comes to Elisha, and Elisha's like, hey, what'd you do? And Gehazi's like, I didn't do anything. And Elisha knows and says, you, you lied to me, and you also demanded a, a price from this guy, uh, Naaman, and that was wrong. And so Gehazi, in the end, is the one that is then struck with the leprosy that that Naaman had. Um, so it's it's again part of the Bible story you probably didn't learn. You just learned about Naaman get, getting cured. Um, but this guy sees it, and that isn't right. And so he he gets some money out of it. And what was he going to do with the money? We don't really ever get to learn and find out. But it wasn't, hey, Elisha, look, here, here's what I got from this guy. Um, he doesn't even tell him about it. So but it tells you that the stuff he got was worthless because now he's a leper. Forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, uh, it's of no use to him. So uh, again, so some examples there of outright breaking of this commandment through lying, um, doing it in a very public way. All right, we're out of time. I got to close this in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would help us uh, to learn and grow as your disciples, to grow in wisdom, and especially, Lord, to help us to curb our tongue so that we would use our words uh, for the benefit of others, again, to build them up, to speak kindly of them, to show grace and to share forgiveness with them, and not to speak lies, not to do harm, not to tear other people down. And uh, we know, Lord, that because of that sinful flesh in us, that this is a very difficult thing for us to do. But we do know that our public testimony and witness is um, valuable when it is positive and uh, e extremely harmful when it is not. And so we ask for your help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you.